In this video, we're going to talk about some of the foundational concepts in linear algebra, like linear independent, span, and bases. But we're not going to talk about those concepts in the context of normal vectors in Rn, the vectors that we've been playing around with for the entirety of this course in linear algebra. Instead, we're going to talk about linear independent, span, and bases for the vector space that is polynomials of degree less than or equal to n. Now, before we jump into it, we should talk just a little bit about what exactly a vector space is and why polynomials of degree less than or equal to n should classify as a vector space. The first thing that I'm going to observe is that polynomials have the same two basic operations that vectors in Rn does. There's a scalar multiplication of polynomials, and there's a vector addition of polynomials. There's both a scalar multiplication of polynomials and a vector addition. Indeed, for scalar multiplication, if I take a polynomial like 1 plus 3x minus x squared, and I multiply it by the scalar 2 out the front, and here this is a vector space, as we say, over the reals, which means the scalars are real numbers, so I'm going to multiply it by a real number like 2. Then I can just define this to be, well, the 1 gets multiplied by 2, the 3x gets multiplied by 2 and becomes 6x, and the minus x squared becomes minus 2x squared. Likewise, if I have two different polynomials, the same one I began with and some other one, I can add these vectors and I add them term by term. Here, the constants 1 and 3 add together to give a 4. The 3x and 0x add up to be a 3x. And the minus x squared and plus 2x squared add up to give you a plus x squared. And so 4 plus 3x plus x squared gives the sum of these two different polynomials. And then, if you wish, you can check that these two different fundamental operations, analogous to vector addition in Rn, satisfy all the other rules that the vectors in Rn does as well. Rules like commutivity, that you can add u plus v is equal to v plus u, and so forth. And indeed, whenever you have a mathematical object where there's a notion of scalar multiplication, and a notion of vector addition that satisfies this long list of properties, all the rules that you would expect from normal study of the vector space of Rn, then we call that a vector space. And so indeed, polynomials of degree less than or equal to 2 satisfy every one of these rules and are a vector space as well. So now we have to talk about linear dependence and independence, span, and finally, basis in this new vector space of polynomials of degree less than or equal to n. First thing I'm going to talk about is linear dependence. The idea is exactly the same definition that we had for Rn, it's just said a little bit more arbitrarily. I'm going to begin with a set of vectors, v1 down to vk, it's just a list. And then the claim is that these are linearly dependent. If there's a way that you can make a linear combination equal to 0, such that not all of the coefficients are 0. That is, there's some t1 down to tk, where the linear combination where those t's are the coefficients, that can add up to 0 in a non-trivial way, with not all of those t's being 0. Now, if this was vectors in Rn, the familiar picture might be that, okay, I'll put up three different vectors living in, say, R2. And then by stretching these vectors and adding them tip to tail, I can rearrange these so that they form a loop. There's a linear combination of those three vectors so that when you add them up, they all come back to zero. That was the picture we saw when we were talking about, say, vectors in R2. But the same general idea, the same motivating definition is going to apply even if we stop thinking about our vectors as being these things with arrows living in R2, but instead being polynomials. It's the same definition. And then, likewise, if that's linear dependence, I can talk about linear independence, it's almost the exact same. It just says, well, the opposite is the case. The only way that the linear combination can be equal to zero is if all of the coefficients, the t1 down to the tk, are all individually zero, and that's linear independence. Basically says there's no way you can add up those vectors tip to tail that gets to zero unless the length of all of them is set to be exactly zero by these coefficients. And so again, we have to try to figure out what's that going to mean in the context of polynomials. So let's see actually an example of this. I have the polynomials 1 minus x, 1 plus x, and x squared. These are three polynomials, and the question is, are they literally independent? What I need to do is take the linear combination. So I can take a generic linear combination. I have a t1 and a t2 and a t3 because there's three vectors. And I multiply them to the 1 minus x, the 1 plus x, and the x squared respectively, and I add this equal to 0. Now, how can I deal with this? One of the things that I observe is that in the 1 minus x and the 1 plus x, that there's a constant term in both of them, the 1, and then there's a linear term, either the minus x or the plus x. So what I'm going to do is just regroup this polynomial in terms of the powers of x. 
So what I mean by this is out the front, I'm gonna have a T1 plus T2, and it's just multiplied by one. Then I'm gonna have a T2 minus a T1, and it's multiplied by X, and finally I don't have to do anything here. The T3 is multiplied by X squared, and we're saying that equals zero. So what's different between these two lines is that in the second of them, I've now ordered it so it's a coefficient times one, a coefficient times X, and a coefficient times X squared. One X and X squared are gonna be very special for us in a moment, so let's just put a pin on that. Now when I look at this equation, it's actually three different equations. The idea is that if this is true, it has to be true for all values of X. So for example, if you set X equal to zero, then only the constant term, the coefficient of one would exist. And indeed, if you allow x to be multiple different values, it must mean that the coefficient of x is zero and that the coefficient of x squared is zero. And so this actually splits into three different equations. The first is for the coefficient of one, then the coefficient of x, and then the coefficient of x squared, respectively. Because my x's are allowed to vary, this first equation is really just three different equations. But now this, that's something we've seen many times. This is exactly the kind of system of equations we've studied extensively in our linear algebra course. So if I just focus on that alone, sort of blind to the fact that it began with polynomials, what I do, well, I'd say I could write down some sort of matrix for this. I'd say I could row reduce this particular matrix, and I would just get that the identity matrix times T1, T2, T3 is equal to zero. Now this identity matrix has full rank, it's got a one in every column, it's got a one in every row, there's many ways to say it. Either way, this is a unique solution. The only way to satisfy this is that T1 equals T2 equals T3 equals zero. And so this example is literally independent. The only way you can satisfy this is if all of the coefficients are zero. It's literally independent. Okay, so that was linear independence. Next up, I'll talk about, well, span. Span is actually defined just completely analogously to how we've done in the past. It says if you want to take the span of a list of vectors, v1 down to vk, then what do you do? You just take all of your combinations of it. So now I'm going to write this as C1V1 down to CKVK, and my condition here is that those coefficients are just real numbers. By the way, the condition that just normal Rn and that polynomials of degree 2 with real coefficients both have the coefficients being real numbers, there's actually other generalizations of this. For example, you could imagine those coefficients could be complex numbers. There's other vector spaces that we're not going to talk about right now. Nevertheless, we have this notion of span it just says take all the linear combinations and that's the span. Many of the theorems we've proven in the past can just all be repeated. So for example, the proof that the span is a subspace, you could repeat the exact same arguments and get that the span here is a subspace of the vector space of polynomials of degree less than or equal to m. And then the final definition I'll put up is the notion of a basis. And the notion of a basis, again, is exactly what we've seen before, it's just an arbitrary vector space v now, which in the examples we're going to talk about is often going to be polynomials of degree less than or equal to n in the real numbers. Nevertheless, it's got the two conditions, one, linear independence, and two, that it spans the vector space. So if I ask you to prove something as a basis, you basically have these two different things you have to check, linear independence and span. Okay, so, well, let's do this. The same example that we had previously, namely the 1 minus x, 1 plus x, and x squared. Now I've just changed the question, I'm saying, is it a basis? Well, we've already done a lot of work on this example, we've already shown that that list of three vectors is linearly independent. So what remains to show that it's a basis is that it spans all of the two-degree polynomials, P2, over the real numbers. So what does that mean? Well, what I'm saying now is if I take all linear combinations, note that I'm just shifting notation to match my definition, my coefficients are now C1, C2, and C3, but nevertheless, it's the exact same expression, but I'm saying that this equals not zero now, but an arbitrary polynomial, a plus bx plus cx squared. And the point is, could I take a linear combination of the three given vectors and get to anything with any value of a, b, and c? I'm going to rearrange in exactly the same way, so the left-hand side is, well, a coefficient in front of 1, a coefficient in front of x, and a coefficient in front of x squared. And then in the exact same way, I can go and interpret this as three different equations. The equation that has to do with the coefficients of 1, the coefficients of x, and the coefficients of x squared. The only difference now, as opposed to the right-hand side being 0, 0, 0, it's now a, b, c. Okay, so focusing in just on this system of equations, it's exactly like we've seen before. The coefficient matrix on the left-hand side just looks exactly the same as it did previously. I can row reduce it in exactly the same way, and I get the identity matrix. And because I have this identity matrix with its full rank, it means that 
every ax equal to b gives a unique solution. Or in other words, this original system that I have, doesn't matter what your little a, your little b, and your little c was, you can always find the coefficient c1, c2, and c3 such that it satisfies it. This is going to always be solved. And so for our example that we have, it matches both conditions. It's got the linear independence, and it's got the fact that it spans all of the degree two polynomials. So yes, this is a basis for this particular vector space. Now, while it's true that this is a basis, it is not what I will call the canonical basis or the most natural basis for you to use. The most natural basis is, well, we've actually almost seen it already. It's the one, the x, the x squared, dot, 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 all the way down to xn. That is the so-called canonical or standard basis for pn of, or in other words, the polynomials of degree less than or equal to n over the real numbers. And indeed, to illustrate this, well, we'll just repeat the computation, but just very, very briefly. If I look at the standard linear combination of these things, so a linear combination of the 1 down to the x to the n, then the corresponding coefficient matrix is just the identity matrix, the n by n identity matrix. Note that this identity matrix is n plus 1 by n plus 1. Indeed, when it was degree 2 or less polynomial, we had a 3 by 3 matrix, so indeed a degree n polynomial gives an n plus 1 by n plus 1 matrix. The basic reason here is that if you think about all the powers of n, we also have x to the 0 be included. So it's going from 0 up to n, and that's why there's n plus 1 of them. Either way, it's the identity matrix, which has full rank and so has unique solutions to any system of equations. That's going to give that it spans everything and that it's linearly independent. So thinking about this vector space of polynomials, the parallels between what we studied before and what we're looking at now is really, really very tight. Indeed, there's ways that you can actually think of polynomials of degree less than or equal to n as really just being the same thing, or what we sometimes call isomorphic, to the vector space r n plus 1, that you can specify exactly the notion which you think of these things as being equal. But the point is that it shouldn't be surprising that a lot of the same kind of analysis repeats ourselves. And indeed, that's often be the case. You're going to see many different types of vector spaces and you want to do the same kind of analysis, the same proofs of the same types of theorems. And that's one of the powers of abstracting or generalizing a concept as well, is that even if you're in a new scenario where things superficially look very different, you can use a lot of the old structures and arguments. Indeed, that's exactly what we're doing here when we play around with polynomials. All right, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, give it a like because YouTube likes algorithm just as much as us mathematicians do. If you have questions about the video, please leave it down in the comments and we'll do some more math in the next video.